Good morning, everyone. So let's do this. <clears throat> Today we want to learn how to do objective three on the homework. And some of this might be needed, again, depending on your browser and uh, language of choice and libraries you're using for TCP, uh, possibly homework um, objective two as well. We want to talk about buffers. So what happens when someone sends a very large file to your server? We want to handle uh, effectively, practically arbitrary file sizes. Uh, nothing like several terabytes, you know, but practical sizes. Uh, we want to be able to handle anything up to like, I don't know, a gigabyte. Should be able to be manageable by your server. Um, but how are we going to do that? Let's talk about buffers, baby. So when we get a file upload, we're going to get it as this multi-part. Oh, oh, I should, uh, I should ask, does anyone have questions before we get into this? I'm just going to dive right into content today. If not, we got to handle large cats. Yeah. If you're like Nicholas and want to have uh, several gigabyte, what did you get up to for file size? I had to create the submission of 42 megabytes. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, the max submission size in Autolab for homework two is 50 megabytes, so keep that in mind when you're submitting, uh, which I had to, which I increased for Nicholas. But what, uh, what are you using for testing locally? But, but how big is your, the image that you had? Oh, you had a bigger one than that, right? Never mind. <laughs> Sorry. For, for what you submitted, yeah, it's smaller. But anyway, uh, you can test with arbitrarily large files, but uh, a few megabytes will be enough. That's all we're going to use for testing, like probably one to two megabytes, because uh, that'll make sure that, um, that you're doing what we're going to talk about here. So we have file uploads. We can, users can upload files, images, to our server. This is an exciting feature. This is a, a nice feature to have in our sites, uh, but we have a big issue that we're about to come up with uh, when we're handling these image uploads. So first, a quick reminder of the, the format. We're going to get this uh, multi-part form request. <clears throat> this is probably a lot of what you'll be doing on your homework. Objectives one and two, getting your parser to work with this format. Uh, it's going to take a little bit of time. There are a lot of really nuanced points with this. Uh, I strongly recommend writing this in a separate a uh, file, a separate function, and then testing that separately, uh, per, even with uh, unit tests maybe, but at least with the main like I showed le in last lecture. Uh, if you're running your server every time you're testing your parser, it's going to take you a long time to debug every little nuanced point uh, about this format. Uh, I would write my testing locally. Don't touch TCP at all during your testing. And then once you know you're parsing this properly, then hook it up to your TCP socket, hook it up to your server, and then see if it's working. Uh, so uh, with this format, we do have a new line after each part. Uh, so keep that in mind. There is a new line character here. There's a new line character here. There's a new line character here. Uh, so keep that in mind when you're parsing. If you have that extra new line character that you're interpreting as part of your file, oh, right here is the important one. If you have that extra new line character as part of your file, uh, it, it's going to corrupt the file uh, just a little bit. It might still render. You might get away with it. It might be fine. Um, but it, also, it might not. So just keep aware. Be aware of that. At the end of the bytes of the file is a new line character. So when we're reading this data, we're doing something like this, you know, depending on what language you have. Uh, I, I looked through the languages. There are. For anybody who's interested in the stats, there are two people using Go, three people only using JavaScript. So sorry, probably not many JavaScript examples in lecture. And the rest are using Python. So a lot of you did take my advice and are using Python. It is, the, uh, in my opinion, the easiest way to go through this course, especially when my lecture examples are so focused on Python. Uh, we're basically turning this into a Python course. If you don't want to use Python, you want to use one of those other languages, sure, that's fine. Uh, just know that you're not going to get very many lecture examples, and I won't have any lecture examples in Go. Uh, if you're using Go, I assume you know what you're doing. Uh, to make the decision to choose Go, you probably don't need my help, to be honest. Uh, you can figure this stuff out uh, if, you're, um, if you're using Go. Uh, for JavaScript, uh, 
I, I want to say the same assumption is there. You should know what you're doing if you're going against the recommendation to use Python. But uh, we'll see with the JavaScript developers. But I will still show a little bit of JavaScript, uh, like right here. Uh, so you're going to do one of these two things to read bytes from the socket. You've been doing this throughout homework one, throughout the semester so far. You have one of these two things, or uh, the syntax of Go to read from that uh, TCP socket, which I believe the Go syntax is more like the JavaScript syntax, the JavaScript approach. So we're reading data. This receive is saying, give me information from the TCP socket. And this on data says, when there's data to be read from the, function, from the socket, call this callback function, which in this example doesn't do anything. So we're going to read from the, the TCP socket and then parse. That's, we're familiar with that. That's uh, old school. That's old stuff. We've been doing that for weeks. So a reminder about TCP, TCP is a persistent connection. There's a three-way handshake and then a persistent connection. It's basically a tunnel between the two devices, the, uh, the two processes even. And we can communicate information over this TCP socket connection. The important part here is that this is a streaming protocol. TCP is a streaming protocol. It's not a, a packet protocol. It's not a message protocol. You don't send one HTTP request over a TCP socket. I mean, we do. That's how we use it. But TCP does not see it that way. TCP just sees a stream of bytes, and that's it. It's just a stream of bytes. It's a two-way connection, and we can send bytes. This process can send bytes to this process. This process can send bytes to this process. That's it. That's what TCP cares about. TCP and TCP really cares about uh, reliability, making sure those bytes get there on time, or not on time, uh, making sure those bytes get there uh, ever. Um, uh, UDP would be getting it there fast. Uh, but TCP makes sure the bytes get there eventually and in the proper order. That's all TCP does, but it is a stream of bytes. So with one GET request, we didn't really care about this. We didn't have to think about it. Even with the POST request in homework one, the POST request was small enough. Uh, it was just uh, a pretty self-contained chunk of bytes. We would read from the stream once, and we would just happen to get the whole request. And we didn't have to think about it too much. No big deal. So for all of homework one, and homework one's carefully crafted to make sure that that's the case, you just go to this stream. Whenever there are bytes to read, there's no issue. You just read once. The entire HTTP request is all right there in those bytes that you read. But what happens when we have file uploads that are large? What happens when we're trying to handle large images, or even moderately sized images? 91K, a moderately sized image uh, for, for the Flamingo. Uh, what do we do here? At this point, we might not be able to read this entire request, especially the bytes of the file. Obviously, I can't fit it all on the slide. We might not be able to read this entire request in one read from the TCP socket. We go, TCP socket, you got some information for me? It'll say, yeah, here's some bytes. It might not be, and in most cases, when, especially when the images get large, it will not be the entire request. It won't be able to contain. I won't be able to tell you all of the bytes of the image in one read from the TCP stream. Because it's going to say, oh, I got a whole bunch of bytes coming in. Here's some of it. You want to read from the stream now? Here's what I have ready for you. And that's going to keep reading more data from the client. And then when you ask it, hey, you got some bytes for me? It'll say, OK, I got some more bytes for you. And you'll have to read multiple times to get all of the bytes of the request. And of course, what happens when we give you a 1.8 megabyte file? When we upload this, you're definitely going to, uh, you're definitely not going to read the entire request in one read. You're not going to get that, uh, that entire request. And we're going to make sure, like, uh, this, uh, this right here is the max number of bytes to read from the TCP socket. Uh, what some students may be inclined to do is just make this a gigabyte or something. Uh, we're going to watch for that when we grade. Uh, if you're doing that and bypassing buffering, uh, you're getting uh, probably a one. I think that'd be a one for objective three. Uh, you're not getting credit for that. 
uh, you have to actually implement buffering, which we're about to talk about. So when you receive data, this is saying read at most 1K bytes from the TCP stream. Well, we have way more than 1K bytes that we're reading when we're uploading this high quality image. It's not going to do it for us. Same with JavaScript. We don't set the buffer size. It's set in JavaScript itself in Node. Uh, but it's not going to read this entire image in one go. I forget the number, but it, I'm going to do a demo. We'll, it'll remind me what the number is. So how do we handle this? So your TCP socket is going to be a streaming protocol. And they're going to have a built-in buffer of a certain size. Or in Python, you specify the size of the buffer. Read at most, or, or it will have a buffer, but it, say read at most this many bytes from the data that's being buffered in the TCP library. So what we need to do is build our own buffer that's going to read the bytes one chunk at a time and reassemble the request. Once we have all of the data, all the bytes, then we can handle the request. So the user's going to send a request. In the past, we read once. We get one chunk that contains everything we need, and we're done. We, we handle that request. We send a response, and then we go read from the socket again. No big deal. Now we have lots of data. What if we have a lot of data to read? What if we even have streaming video? How are we going to do streaming video just by going to the socket once saying, OK, give me your video? Uh, we're not going to read that whole thing that's streaming live in one go. We physically can't. We can't do that uh, because we need the bytes from you know, the last few seconds. OK, give me the next few seconds. Give me the next few seconds as it's happening. How are you going to do that if you're just reading once from the socket? Not going to happen. Uh, and a lot of different cases that can cause this thing. What if uh, a browser sends half a request on its TCP socket, and then the Wi-Fi you know, has a little hiccup for a moment, and then it sends the rest of the request? When you go to read from the TCP socket, you're not getting the whole request. There are things, even with small requests, there are things that can happen where you only get part of the request. Uh, this is something we really cheesed in homework one, uh, very carefully cheesed to be able to say, oh, just read from the stream once and assume it's an entire request. It's pretty dangerous to actually do that. Uh, you should, what you should do is read, check to see if you have that CRLF, CRLF, and if not, read again. Uh, that's what we should be doing. We're, we're careful. Uh, we're not too careful, but the homework is crafted in a way that you don't run into that issue. Uh, Mostly because that would be just an extra pain that I'd have to put you through on the homework. So when the, server, uh, when the user is sending a whole bunch of data that we can't read, we have to read, 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 read to get all of this information. Uh, now we're going to have to go to that TCP socket multiple times. We're typically only reading a few kilobytes at a time. With the Python server, I, I usually set mine at 1K. Uh, and that's what my, my example was at. Uh, I think that's just what the documentation uses, to be honest, for socket server. Um, with Node, it's larger, but it's still only going to be a few K. Um, maybe, I think it's on the order of tens of K. I want to say it's 32K is the buffer size in Node, uh, but I might be wrong on that. It's somewhere in that order of magnitude. So forget requests. Again, safe to say that the requests will be within several K. There are limitations on the size of the headers uh, com you know, entirely, which is only a few K. We just set our buffer size to uh, like 16K, set it to like what Node has. We're always going to have enough uh, buffer in the TCP library to read the entire request, uh, at least the headers of the request, um, assuming that like, the Wi-Fi didn't go out halfway through or things like that. Uh, and in this course, you can make that assumption. You're not going to lose points for saying, oh, I read once, but didn't get the entire get request. Um, that's just not something we're going to do in this course. It'd just be extra tedium. So what we want to do is buffer. That's what we want to talk about. We're going to buffer. So instead of going to the socket once, we're going to the socket multiple times. We're going to go to the socket, read get some information, store those bytes, go to the socket again, read some more bytes, concatenate those with the bytes that we've already read, 
have some data structure that stores the entire request, some, uh, some byte array, and keep appending, keep concatenate, um, keep pushing, uh, I forget what the term, but keep combining these arrays, these byte arrays into a larger and larger and larger array until you know you've read the entire request. And then only once you've read the entire request, then you can process the thing, uh, get the bytes of the file, save it to disk, do whatever you're doing with that file. Yeah, receive 9999. <laughs> yeah, no. Receive one and then receive a whole bunch, technically. But you didn't buffer at that point. Any questions so far while we're hanging out in the conceptual area of the lecture? Yeah, one gigabyte, but that's what I meant. So up to a gigabyte, that's wild. Probably takes a while. Everyone feeling good about this so far? So our new strategy becomes, and here's the, basically the TLDR of buffering. When you receive a large request, or really any request, you'll rewrite your server to do this on every request, um, or at least every post request, I suppose. I guess it depends on how you code it. You're gonna read bytes from the socket. This is what you've been doing so far in homework one. You go to the TCP socket, you say, give me some bytes. You get those bytes, and in this class, we can still make an assumption that on the first read from the TCP socket, you're going to get everything up until the first CRLF, CRLF. You're going to get all of the headers. Read once, you can assume you have all the headers. If that assumption's ever false, it's not gonna hurt your grade. We're gonna uh, make sure to, uh, to give you whatever points we need to give you in, in grading. I haven't seen that affect anyone yet, um, but if it does, uh, we'll take care of it, because I, I tell you, you can make that assumption. <clears throat> Read once, assume you have all the headers, and start parsing. Parse the headers, we've done this before, basically treating it like a GET request, parse all the headers, uh, whatever code you have for parsing headers, and then read the content length. So you're gonna read from the TCP socket, look for your CRLF, CRLF, separate the headers and the body, or uh, yeah, the headers and the body, parse the headers, find the content length, and then check the length of the body of this request, everything after that CRLF, CRLF, the length of that byte array, is that equal to my content length that I read from the headers? That's the check you wanna make, that's the big check. Have I read this many bytes? Read the content length. Have I read content length number of bytes? If not, you gotta go back to that TCP socket and say, give me some more data, because there's some more data coming and I need it. I need that before I can process this request. And keep doing that until you've read content length number of bytes. From the body, content length is only the length of the body. Do not count the bytes from the headers or that CRLF, CRLF. Uh, those four bytes, don't count those as your content length. It's everything after that. Uh, that's the body. That's what the content length measures. Just like the responses that you sent in homework one, content length is computed the same exact way when you're getting requests. So keep that in mind when you're counting uh, your content length. If you're looking for an extra byte that doesn't exist, you're gonna be in an infinite loop constantly reading from the TCP socket. Uh, this is usually, this is easy, easiest lead, uh, lead done uh, in Python at least with a well, um, with a while loop, well length of my buffered body is not equal to content length, go to the TCP socket and call receive again. And then keep concatenating, keep building until you have content length number of bytes. In JavaScript, it's a little bit different. You have to, uh, you don't control reading from the socket. So every time that, re that uh, on data, uh, I forgot now. Uh, on data, I think it is. Every time that's called, you have to append to your buffer 
And then if you have content link number of bytes, process the request else, just let that function end, let it return. And then when you come back, uh, that's going to be whenever there's more data to be read. Then once you have content link number of bytes read from the body, process the request, do all of your multi-part form parsing, and, uh, and do all the stuff that we've been talking about the last few lectures. Uh, is, it, is it bizarre that the content length is a few bytes larger than the body? Yes, that, that won't happen. I mean, unless there's a bug in your browser, uh, that would be the only thing that would cause it. The browser should be always making sure that the content length is exactly the number of bytes in the body. Um, if I were to guess, uh, I would guess that you're, I don't know if I do have a guess. My guess would be that you're off by two and you're trimming the new line character at the end of the body. Um, but that's just a guess. But somewhere you're losing a byte, you're not counting all the bytes that you read from the body. That content length should be exactly equal to the number of bytes in the body. Got to increase this. I'm not increasing the submission size again. I mean, I just need your code. I don't need your test images when you submit. We'll have our own test images that are large that we use for testing. There are some simplifying assumptions you can make. Uh, the one big one I said like eight times already. Um, when a file is being uploaded, you can assume that only one user is uploading simultaneously, so you don't have to maintain multiple buffers. In reality, multiple users could upload images at the same time, and you have to store um, an arbitrary number of buffers going simultaneously and associate each buffer with the user who's sending that image. Uh, in Python, the way we, just the way the socket server works, we wouldn't even have to worry about that. Uh, this is a simplifying assumption for JavaScript and Go uh, developers, uh, where you actually just get a callback called whenever there's data received from any user. You would have to track which user it is and which user is currently buffering. Uh, and nobody's going to send requests. Like, nobody's going to send a git request for your home page in the middle of buffering either. Uh, so you can assume that as well. If you're buffering, that's the only thing your server has to be doing is buffering. In homework three, we'll handle simultaneous connections. Don't worry, that's coming up. But uh, not right now. You can assume the first read contains all the headers. That's the one I said uh, 100 times already. Uh, uh, that means you can read the content like. If the first request, the first read from the buffer doesn't contain all the headers, you can't safely read the content length. Uh, you'd have to enter a special buffer where you're buffering until you get CRLF, CRLF. Uh, we're not going to play that game. It's, it's just extra. I said it already. Um, and you can guarantee that we're going to test with files larger than your TCP buffer size. So if you're doing this silly thing where you're just increasing the max number of bytes you receive, from the TCP socket, and then just saying, well, I'm always going to read it all in one go, and then not buffering at all, uh, that's not going to work. Uh, what we'll do in these cases, we're just going to go in your code. The TAs are going to look for this on every, uh, every Python submission. Uh, we'll go into this and then make this something reasonable, and then upload a file and see if it breaks, which it probably will. If you're doing this, probably not doing buffering. Okay, any questions? What is uh, CRLF? Uh, CRLF. I, I say it quick, so CRLF. Maybe the L gets eight in there. Uh, but that's the slash R slash N. I like CRLF because it rolls off the tongue a lot better. So I'll start saying that in lecture. But carriage return line feed slash R slash N, or just the new line character that we use in HTTP. Oh, and you edited your. <laughs> all right, any questions on buffering? That's like all the theory behind buffering. It, it's a bit trickier to actually code up, as with most things in this course. Uh, but that's all I had to say about buffering. So any questions on that? You feel like you can go into the code at this point and code up some buffering?
I think the lecture question is pretty easy today. Hopefully, you've been paying enough attention to get this one. Uh, I couldn't think of a harder one to, to ask about buffering, so it's fairly free. Can we have examples in TypeScript? If you make a homework two submission in TypeScript, I might start showing some TypeScript examples, but with zero people using TypeScript, no. Does buffer return anything? I don't, I'm not sure I understand the question. So you're not writing a method named buffer. Uh, you're just implementing the concept of a buffer, uh, which no, it wouldn't return anything. Uh, just, uh, so if somebody's not in lecture and submits C, D, or E, I know that they're up to some shenanigans. What? Is, is that any better? <laughs> I mean, the 42, fine, but if, if they're not paying enough attention to answer this, like, they don't deserve credit, <laughs> whether they're here or not. To dynamically call receive of remaining content link? Uh, no. Would I take off points? Maybe not. But uh, I think you could get in trouble on that. So if the rest of the bytes aren't ready, like that's a maximum size. So if the rest of the bytes aren't ready and you re call receive, the TCP socket might be like, well, I don't have that many bytes for you, but I got this many. And then your code's going to break. Yeah, but if you put like a sleep for a second in there, <laughs> please don't do that. <laughs> All right, I, so I will show, <coughs> uh, I will show one. I'll occasionally show some JavaScript. Since JavaScript is so much different for buffering than Python, I do want to show some JavaScript here. So here's JavaScript on data. Uh, I'm not doing anything. I'm not returning anything. I commented out all my functionality. I'm going to get the, uh, the client address just to print it to the screen. And I'm going to print out, oh, I don't even need this one. And I'm going to print out, I received from this client this many bytes of data. And that's all my server does. It doesn't do anything. So let's run this, and you can kind of see the the output there. I'm going to run the server. And I have just some HTML here. There's no server hooked up to this. I just double click the HTML template file. So we don't even get much information. But I'm going to use this form, which is hard coded to send to localhost 8000, just so I can get a request to my uh, server file. Let's send a parrot. Which, which is 29K. So we'll send a 29K image. Nothing's going to happen. It's going to hang and then error because my server doesn't do anything. And we actually got the entire request in one go. So that image was small enough that I actually went to the socket once, read, and got all of the bytes. So we didn't even need to buffer for this one. We got the whole request in one go because that buffer, I think it's 64K. Either 64 or 32, but we'll find out in a second. So let's send another request. But let's send a larger file. Let's go 91K. That's going to get uh, be over both of my guesses. Let's send the Flamingo. And now when we send that, this was from the previous request. Should get rid of some of my, oh, it's too late now. And now we're going to see the buffering, or not the buffering because we didn't implement any buffering, but the TCP buffering, I guess. So this callback is going to be called multiple times now. The first time it's called, just a reminder what we're doing. All we're doing is call, uh, data dot length and printing it out. Uh, the first time we get a request from this user, which we can tell is a different user from the previous request, it, it's a different TCP connection. This connection, the first time we read, we only got 843 bytes. 
So the first time we read from the socket, we only got what looks like uh, the headers. It's probably just going to be the headers up until that CRLF, CRLF, and that's it. Uh, browsers sometimes do this, uh, depending on your browser. I think Chromium browsers do this uh, more than others. When there's a big file to read and then upload, it'll just send the headers while it's waiting for the file to be read from disk. And once the file is read from disk, then it starts shipping bytes of the file which it didn't do with the smaller file, but with a larger file, the browser said, OK, here's the headers. First time I read, I have zero bytes of the body. This is common. It's expected. Don't panic when this happens. If you have content length of uh, several kilobytes, megabytes even, and you read from the socket once, and there's just no body to the request, don't panic. Your image is on the way, but you're going to have to read from the stream again. And then I don't do anything. I just let this function end. And then this function is called again. My callback is called again as the bytes start coming in for the file. This is all handled by the library. I have uh, fairly little control over when I read bytes from, uh, from the socket. And I get 65k bytes. That's the, the buffer. So I, it was or 65k, 64k. Um, so I said 32 or 64. 32, or 64 was the right answer. 64K buffer size. So you can guarantee we're going to test with images larger than that. Uh, and then I needed another read to get the rest of the bytes. So three reads from the socket to be able to get this entire Flamingo request, this Flamingo upload. This is called each time. So you're going to want a buffer. I guess it could just be null. Like buffer plus equals data, something like that. The syntax, I don't know the syntax out of the top of my head. I think this works, but it might not. Um, but we're going to want to have the scope of our buffer outside of this callback. So we want to, excuse me, persist across calls of this callback. It's similar structure. I believe it's similar structure in Go. There's kind of two approaches to these TCP servers. This approach, where you have callbacks and uh, an event-driven architecture, and then the Python uh, method of doing it, which is a little different. Scala, nobody's using Scala this semester, uh, which makes me sad from a 116 perspective. Uh, but Scala with ACA does the same thing. It's going to be similar to this with actor messages that you receive uh, in, uh, in an event-based architecture like this. With Python, it's a little different. So I want to get rid of all of this. I want to close it. Oh, I didn't even send a, a large image. Let me send a large image first. So let's send goose. We got to go back to that socket a lot. Is this why I was confused? The buffer size is dynamic? So I was right with both 32 and 64 and 16, apparently. So I can tell this is the same client each time. And that image, which is several megabytes, it takes a lot of reads from the TCP socket. There's a lot of buffering happening to be able to read all of those bytes. A lot of reads, enough to overflow my console. I can't even see all of the reads from that. TCP socket. Uh, so if you're trying to cheese this, I mean, you got to read a lot of times. You have to do this programmatically. <clears throat> so let's head over to Python. Oops. I want the client ID. I want to print the length of the data, and that's it. If I run this, come on, node, give me my port. Do it. Oh, it did it. And I'm going to go right to the large image. So when I do this, I'm going to get 
this client is sending 1K of data, and that's it. It said max size 1K. I read from the socket. I got my 1K, which will contain my headers, but I didn't get much information from the body of the request. So when we're buffering in Python, once we hit the end of this method, that connection is closed. We're no longer connected to that client. This method is called once per TCP connection, once per client. So in Python, and this is what I had. Well, the first time I showed this Python server, I had this code in there, and it, I think it confused, um, was a little confusing. But I did well true. I'm going to have to wait for that port to, oh, no, it did. OK. Uh, well true, and I want to keep, now don't do well true in your code, unless you're using a break, I guess, if you want to set it up that way. Um, but I want some loop. This will actually be, should be well, I haven't read content length bytes. Uh, I'm just doing well true just to show off, uh, show off what we're talking about here. So now I'm going to call this code, loop back, and call receive again. You need to keep calling receive yourself. Uh, not unlike JavaScript where it's going to be called for you, the only thing that's called for you is handle for one, uh, once per connection not once per there's data to be read off the TCP socket. And then it's up to you to continuously call receive to get more bytes if you're buffering. So you have to enter a buffering state where you're going to keep reading the bytes. And now let's upload that large image again. And now we're reading 1K at a time. It's going to take a while for a megabyte file. But 1K at a time, and we're reading, we're reading, we're reading, we're buffering, we're buffering, we're buffering until we get all of the requests then we can start handling that request. So you're going to read the headers, parse content length. If uh, and well you haven't read content length number of bytes, keep calling receive and getting more data. That's your general strategy. Will the content length of a post with no body be zero, or will it be the size of the body still? If the, if the post has no body, the content length would be zero, which wouldn't really be, like that shouldn't be a post request at that point. Um, but if you do get that, if the content length is absent, it should be treated as zero content length. So it should be like a get or else. Get the content length header. If it doesn't exist, content length is zero. That's what. Uh, on our redirects, that's what Firefox drives me nuts with, is uh, it doesn't treat an absent content length as a content length of zero, so we have to add content length of zero. Um, but you won't see that. In this homework, at least, you won't see that. If there's a file on the way, the content length will be the expected full content length after the entire file is sent. Content length is always the full content length. So if there's no body in that first read from the socket, the browser just sent the headers first, the content length will still be the full content length of what's expected, not what's sent in that first read, in that first chunk. All right. Any more questions about buffering? I want to shift gears a little bit into a common mistake I always see on homework two. Any questions about buffering before we jump into that? All right, let's do this. Which, if I can't do this in 10 minutes, we'll just uh, pick this up on Friday. But I have a, some test code here just to show off some, uh, some something. I don't know. You'll see. We'll just do it. Uh, so I'm reading an image from a file. Right now I'm reading cat.jpg from the sample website. And I'm just creating like a fake request so I can do some testing without spinning up my TCP server, without getting 
error, address already in use, and change my port. I don't want to do any of that crap. Uh, so I'm doing some testing outside of my server to test some uh, a specific feature, and we're going to see a specific bug that uh, hopefully none of you run into, because I'm going to show you in lecture, but that you can potentially run into. I've kind of mentioned this before, but I want to do a demo of it. Uh, I'm printing out the request that I'm sending, and then I'm going to parse this request. I just have a very partial parser. Uh, in this parser, and hopefully you can tell me that this is bad right away, I'm going to split on CRLF, CRLF. I'm going to print how many splits I got, which I would expect to be two. I'm going to split on that new line. Uh, I'm not building a whole multi-part request, or else I would expect more parts. Um, I'm going to print out the length of that, get the headers, get the image, which the entire body is just the bytes of the image. I just concatenated uh, the image after the CRLF, CRLF. And then I'm going to write the bytes of the file to, uh, to a file, the bytes of the image to a file. So partial functionality, I'm going to read that, get the bytes of the file, then save it to disk. So I'm going to read the cat, put it in a request, print it out, and then parse it and save the file. The image is this. This is what we would expect to see. Let's run this. And what do we see? The image. Yay, it worked. So we split. Oh, that's the first thing that's printed. So we split. We did get two splits. Everything's what we expected. Here's our headers. Here's the entire request. Those are all the bytes of the file. And we saved it to, uh, to a file. That's pretty uneventful. So let's change this to a worse parser. This one, instead of splitting on CRLF, CRLF, we're just going to split on CRLF, which is probably what you're doing for Git requests, which is a fine thing to do for, for Git requests. You can go right into splitting on new lines. You're going to split on new lines, iterate over those splits, read each header one at a time, it was actually harder to write the crappy code, the crappy version of this. Uh, it was much easier to write the, the good version was the easiest one to write. Um, uh, split on new lines, parse each header one at a time until I read a blank line. And I'm parsing all in bytes. I never want to convert this to a string because I'm going to destroy my image if ever I parse the, uh, convert the entire request to a string. I'm going to look for that new line. Once I find that, I'm going to break out of this loop, remove the blank line, and whatever's left is going to be my image, at least I hope. Let's run this one. And now my image is broken. This is definitely a terrible way to parse. So let's see what happened. Looks like I read my headers fine. Everything was fine there. But if I look at the bytes of my request, or maybe I should quiz you all. What, what happened here? What broke? Your brain? <laughs> my turn broke? Did he see my code? So if we look at our request here, we have this slash r slash n. Let me copy this. Let me control F. Let me paste it. And I'm going to look for slash r slash n. It's where we expect it to be. It's separating the headers. And there's two of them separating the headers from the body. Everything's cool so far. Yep, yep, uh-oh. But we have another one. Right in the middle of the bytes of the file, those two bytes, back to back, just happen to exist in the bytes of the file. Now, it's not meant to represent a CRLF. It's just those bytes happen to appear in the file. It's allowed to do that. The file format, JPEG, can use those bytes. They're not reserved universally for HTTP requests. It's just, just two bytes back to back. Those sequences of ones and zeros are allowed in anything. And they happen to appear in this image. So when we split on that new line character, we happen to chop our image in half. We cut it apart. 
And then when we got the remaining data here, it wasn't actually the remaining data, it was everything before this. It was these bytes, and we didn't get the rest of the bytes of our file. So if you're splitting the bytes based on that new line character, you might be chopping up your file. So what we want to do is just look for the first occurrence with a find. Uh, don't chop up everything is, uh, is the punchline. Don't just uh, replace everything. But let's go back to our let's go back to our bad image or our bad uh, no yeah just bad uh, the bad one where we're splitting on CRLF CRLF and I want to switch my image to goose which if you're uh, to disappoint some of you it's not actually a goose it's another cat oh come on it's a larger image so it takes longer to load. I might have saved, accidentally saved a corrupt version of it, uh, which is the, the point of what we're doing. But. And then I'm going to run this again. And I can already see I got three splits. And when I look at the output, I'm only getting partial part of my file. So this image, especially when you have larger images, it's, there's a higher likelihood that the bytes CRLF, CRLF, back to back, which didn't appear in the, the first image, the cat. But in this goose image, our other cat, this byte sequence appears in that image. So even if you're splitting on CRLF, CRLF, that byte sequence might appear in your image bytes. So, uh, uh, and to break this down, a slash R, that's an, a 0D in hex. Slash N is a 0A in hex. So a slash R slash N is 0 D 0 A, which are these bits. There's no magic here. It's not a special character. I mean, it is an ASCII and UTF-8. Uh, sure, it's a special character, kind of, to us, not to the computer, though. But really, it's just these bytes, these bits. If those bits appear anywhere in your image and you're splitting on CRLF, CRLF, you're going to split your image apart. These bytes are allowed to appear in your image. That's perfectly legal. Don't split your image apart by splitting on these new line characters. Um, and uh, have a great day. I'll see you Friday.